Before we start, of course, and Ben would say you can't possibly do this without setting, having a benchmark, because it's important to know what the House thinks at the beginning. So could we have the motion? So the motion is, should the government have a design strategy? And I'm sure you've come with your views and you've this morning if you'd like to vote now. And we'll go for our five seconds. Okay. The task cut out. Um, so those are the figures. We will we will revisit these at the end. We're now going to have our conversation. If I could now invite Tim Bradshaw to kick off the debate of the <coughs> Thank you very much for inviting me to open um, this debate on whether the government should have a design strategy or not. Um, I think a very timely debate um, with economic growth stalling, public deficit at nearly 8% of GDP and debt at 84% of GDP and growing. Well, obviously my answer is yes, the government should have a design strategy because I think it can help out in the challenges we face. But, and it's quite a big but, don't bother if all it amounts to is a one-off report that sits gathering virtual dust in an electronic archive somewhere. The last thing we need right now is a minister thinking, report written, box ticked, job done. A design strategy means to be active and ambitious, setting a clear direction of travel, focusing on realising opportunities for the UK and developing our competitive advantage, dealing with the challenges we know lie ahead and creating breathing space for the challenges we don't yet know about. The strategy needs to be alive and coherent, being acted upon on a daily basis across all areas of government and in terms of all of its interactions with the public and wider economy. And once and for all, the strategy also needs to break the link that explicitly or implicitly equates design with just the creative industries. Design is essential in all areas of policy and regulatory development, in all areas of service delivery, in business operations, in processes, product development, and increasingly in changing behaviours, something that I think is absolutely critical and should be at the heart of thinking when we're trying to tackle pressing issues such as climate change and obesity. A design strategy is needed that works both internally in government and externally with stakeholders such as business that I guess I'm here representing today. So internally, uh, the good news is I think that design is certainly on the government's radar screen. We heard from Fergus this morning, and design will certainly be in the government's research and innovation strategy that's launched next week. But I think we still have a long way to go before design is embedded in thinking as the norm right across government. A proper design strategy could help move things in that direction and provide the leadership. If you look at the government's plan for growth, for instance, that came out of the budget, Design barely features in any meaningful way in that document, and that's despite having a whole chapter on digital and creative industries. Tuesday's autumn statement did mention design a couple of times, perhaps most encouragingly in reference to the design of procurement processes. And the new National Infrastructure Plan is also encouraging, considering the design of projects to, to achieve multiple aims and how to address interdependencies early on in the design stage so that they become opportunities rather than challenges. This is good, but let's go much, much further. Design should feature prominently in every policy. And how DEFRA tackles bovine TB, and how the MOD addresses its defence industrial strategy in education policy. I think we've heard a little bit about that this morning. A coherent approach to design thinking across government could make a real difference. The government currently spends around a quarter of a trillion pounds a year of our money on goods and services. And making wider use of design principles and thinking could see it delivering more efficiently 
more effective outcomes, ultimately allowing government to do more with less and have a better chance of tackling the deficit. Externally then, while well, externally in particular in dealings with business, a designing strategy would help to raise the profile of design, set out the UK's vision and ambitions and stimulate investment. And we need this as part of a strategy for economic growth. Mid-sized businesses, for example, are being hailed by everyone, including the CBI, as the unsung heroes and the future champions of growth in the UK. And looking at them objectively through the lens of the UK Innovation Survey, they do indeed look good. Proportionately, mid-sized businesses invest more in R&D, patent more, and register more designs than either large or small businesses. And these are the good guys. But only 62.5% of them recognise themselves as being innovating, compared with 84% in Germany and 67% in France. We do much worse on the small businesses side. We have to do better than this if we're to compete internationally and create more high-value jobs and growth. And I think that emphasising design is the way forward. Innovative firms spend something like 40% more on design than they do on R&D, and design is also significantly more important for novel innovation. So we can make more of our strengths in design, <coughs> spreading this so that more companies are using it in more areas of their operations, then we'll be in a much better position to export, attract investment, and grow. <coughs> and finally, I think it's worth looking at the economic prize at stake, if we can get this right. Jim O'Neill from Goldman Sachs was at our annual conference last week and mentioned a couple of facts that I think are worth repeating. China is currently growing the equivalent of the Greek economy, that's the Greek economy in good times, every four months. The BRIC countries in aggregate are growing by the equivalent of the Italian economy every year. And remember that Italy is the world's eighth largest economy. If, I say if, if we had a coherent <coughs> cross-government design strategy that helped us make real headway into markets such as these, with new products and service offerings, and a design strategy that helped to tackle the budget deficit and debt with a different approach to public services, then I think I can stand here and confidently see light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you. Tim, thank you for proposing the motion, um, sort of on behalf of the Confederation of British Industry, but as an individual and someone passionate on the subject, but now also, I'd like to invite Laura Haynes, President of the Design Business Association that represents design businesses in the UK. Isn't that a funny starting place to come from to be against the motion? But what you just heard were an awful lot of ifs. If we think across government, if we're able to embed it into industry, if we begin to take design seriously, I know it's odd my speaking against the motion because as president of the DBA, I'm very concerned about the role of design and the promotion of design. I've also spent the last year being a member of the Design Commission where we focus on design and how to ensure that it is better embedded in the government, perhaps part of my frustration. In many ways, a government design strategy is valuable because if nothing else, it's a signal of government support for both the public and private sector. But what we just heard was a plea for a coherent approach towards design. Well, I'm afraid I'm a bit cynical. <coughs> I think there are three reasons why I'm concerned about this motion. First, is that without an overarching vision and plan for action, a strategy is not enough. And we've seen and heard of a number of these. Second, we obviously need a much deeper and more integrated approach. And the third is the basic truth that design vision and thinking simply cannot follow a political agenda or a political calendar. A bit like our train system here. <laughs> Perhaps over the years I've heard far too many good words without equivalent good deeds. 
And I think maybe the starting place is to go back and ask ourselves, what are we talking about? What do we mean by design? What is our definition of design? And why? Why should we have a strategy? Where are we going? I learned something this morning. I learned that I want to go move to Denmark. <laughs> because in Denmark, rather than writing a new strategy for design, they realized the starting place was to go back and establish an overarching vision, an understanding of what we mean by design and what we're finally going to do and what direction we're taking. Where are we heading? Why are we doing this? Without this vision, we don't know what we're trying to achieve with any strategy. Are we to be the world's creators? I don't know. Are we to lead in insight and improvement? Should we look at everything through the lens of society, community, the individual user, or world improvement? <coughs> or are we just doing this for competitive advantage? A little shallow. Without vision leading to strategy and then action, policy is meaningless, as some of us have seen for the last 30 years or so. Without substance, we simply have some very, very nice words, but not what much to move forward with. So we need a vision, and then we need a strategy, and then we need some integrated plans. So what about integration? This must be integrated and joined up through our thinking, planning, and action, starting from a vision, but we also must have an integrated approach or at best, we'll simply confuse people, and at worst, all of the ideals will be completely meaningless. I was impressed with the presentation from Biz this morning. But what good is it if Biz sets up a strategy for innovation and, for innovation and design, if while in education, we stop funding design education? <laughs> what message is that sending people? We're saying design in education is not worthwhile. It's not worth investment. It's not worth following through. So we won't have the designers tomorrow to help implement business strategy for innovation. Or does the structure of budgeting and planning in the health service allow for the inclusion of new design thinking or new design initiatives? This has to be joined up. Who should own this anyway? We see Biz actively developing innovation and design strategies. But does it really only apply to that sector of society? Doesn't design impact much, much more? Shouldn't it be integrated into every part of government and society? On what vision is the design of the cities of tomorrow being based? What's the role of design thinking to improve literacy and communications? How and why are we designing better services for the provision of social benefit, health, transport, immigration? What incredibly long-sighted design belief are we basing high street planning decisions on? Been down high street recently? And how does design impact public behavior and decision making for the greater good? beyond simply the fashionable nudge theories of today. We need integrated thinking. We need to know where we're going and we need to pull it together. At the heart, of course, design is about problem solving. It's about change. It's about cause and effect. It's about communications. But these aren't individual separate thoughts. And we will not improve or deliver real change or benefit with just a broad strategy, a broad brushstroke that is neither grounded in focused outcome or delivered through detailed plans. My fear, my real fear, is that an incomplete approach like this will allow the government to tick a box and say, job well done, and think that we've made a difference yet again by having a statement like, every process should have design at its core. It's lovely, how could you disagree? Motherhood and apple pie, I'm for that, I'm ready to vote. But as my friend Azzy said to me on Tuesday night, you can't be half pregnant. You either have a vision, develop a strategy, and then create the plans to implement, or you'll never give birth. 
As we've seen this morning, we're not doing this on our own. There's a lot going on. We need to understand where the boundaries are and where they aren't. We need an integrated and perhaps a collaborative approach. Our zeitgeist is all about collaboration. Partly because social interaction has changed as a function of technology, but also because the problems are really big and they cross boundaries and they cross borders. And to be successful, we need to collaborate and look for the long term. So finally, and thinking about the long term, we cannot and simply must not align the importance of design in our society to a political agenda or political calendar. Do you remember the worthy words that design and the creative <coughs> industries are the cornerstone and engine of our economy? I think that was spoken just before the cancellations of hundreds or thousands of government design frameworks and contracts. Or the important strategic statements made, and I quote, we need to promote by all practicable means the improvement of design of the products of British industry. That was made in 1944. George Cox ably said that creativity, property employed, carefully evaluated, <coughs> skillfully managed, and soundly implemented is the key to future business success and to national prosperity. Great words and true. But it's time for more than just words. We need a vision that has design at its core. Then we need a strategy that grows out of this vision and can be embedded into the whole of our culture and society through meaningful and integrated action plans. Thank you very much. unjoined up message is what I wanted to, to discuss. I have had the privilege in the last two years of uh, meeting ministers in a number of departments and seen and heard astonishingly different views on design. For instance, in housing, yes, there, there is design is mentioned in, in, in the housing strategy, but if you talk to the minister, he is strongly in view that it should be a popularist choice, that design is a, a popular agenda. Um, he doesn't talk about design leadership. In schools, with my much publicised spat with Michael Gove, um, clearly design is something we no longer need. It's an expensive add-on that uh, is, 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 is not necessary. Strong support for design in export. The UK TI are behind us in our endeavours to, to sell uh, un um, British design for here across the world. Energy distribution. <coughs> They've realised that discussing the design of um, electricity pylons is one way to engage the public with the thought that we're going to have to change the way we distribute energy. So design has become a motivator for discussion. The government's a chief construction advisor says that we need just good enough design. Now that's rather slightly worrying because you wonder where the line is, is, where is coming um, in terms of defining what's good enough but the cost savings are found by reducing design aspiration. And of course, heritage is just completely full of traditional and modern tensions, but I, I think I probably shouldn't go there. I am really pleased to see design so strongly supported in the National Planning Policy Framework. Uh, but at the moment, it's lacking some indication of leadership in that. It's back to the housing argument about it needing to be um, uh, something that is a popularist decision. I think that it's good to hear also that it's very strongly embedded in innovation. But as Chris Wise so very wisely said at the beginning, uh, that good design isn't always about innovation. It's about using existing technologies and thinkings and producing uh, wonderful solutions um, that uh, transcend uh, previous decisions 
but are still within the framework of what we already know. And I was also heartened to hear Tim <laughs> Horton say that it can be the route to government integration. You can actually fuse things around design as a concept to get government de departments to think together. So it has a sort of added benefit, this, this idea of producing a strategy. Can I illustrate it with my own profession? I, in, the, in the last two years, I've had to deal with the concept that architects are people that cream off cash from their own government by taking money out of t teaching innocent children in order to furnish their own egos. On the other hand, I've heard really strong support that uh, we are the products of some of the best design educations in the world and should be promoted as such to growing economies. So, is good design a component of growth or an extravagance? For, for example, are we going to grow through our need to meet the 2020-2050 carbon commitments, or are we just merely demonstrating that we own eco-bling? So, British design, is it worth promoting? In Los Angeles, I saw stationery that was designed in Britain, made in Korea, and sold to the Americans. Let's face it, nobody does cultural context like we do. We're acutely aware of design and style, and we can and do sell this across the world. We are a multicultural society, and we synthesize global design, and we re-export it. And in a recession, we need government that promotes that. It's not advertising that costs money that we're ask, asking for, it's marketing. <coughs> we want our politicians to market us. A few chosen words, attending design expos, a ministerial lead, design policy across all public procurement. It's a very small investment in promotion in order to maintain and grow market. We all know from our businesses it's good business practice to have a coordinated design approach. The British economy is, in a reductive way, an, an, an enormous business that needs pr uh, promoting. What we must want, what, what we must drive for, is stopping the myth, mixed messages from politicians that at times have suggested that the country's designers are selling its population short. Can I go back to procurement? And there are others in the room that I think want to make this point. We cannot support good design through risk adverse systems. We have to learn to do the fuzzy logic bit at the beginning and trust our designers to deliver effectively and uh, with, uh, uh, efficiently and maintain a reasonable level of uh, risk control. This government needs to show that it's in love with the modern world. We cannot aspire to put all the population in Regency homes and offices with stone string courses and cornicing and educate them on vast playing fields of some Eatonville. That's what they want. <laughs> <laughs> you get your turn in a minute then, I know what you're going to say. Modern aspirational solutions need to be celebrated. And we cannot afford the politicians' visions of a green and pleasant land, because there isn't enough space for it. But we can afford good design. Let's be under no illusion. This is a government run by individuals who have been allowed to promote their personal taste, and that's a tough thing to say, without understanding the impact it's having on the design industries. A design strategy with strong leadership across all departments is the responsible approach. Thank you. really more in sorrow than in anger. Um, uh, and I, I do feel that my opponents in this debate have actually been more helpful than I could ever imagine um, uh, in, in, in making the case. And I do wonder whether a meeting like this at the Design Council, you know, obviously it's a bit um, you know, risky to suggest that the a meeting like this at the Design Council might actually vote against government having a policy on things that they hold dear. But I think we've just hold, heard a, a sort of eminent series of reasons why we might want to just ask the government um, a number of questions. So I think I'm absolutely in favour of the motion, but I find myself having to oppose it for three reasons. I would be in favour if the government actually believed in it. Um, and on this, as we've just seen so eloquently, we have a government that exhibits, um, as so much the population do in many areas, 
cognitive polyphasia. <laughs> um, they, they like to, you know, they, 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 have, they hold conflicting ideas about the same thing at the same time and feel no apparent dissonance. Um, so, you know, we have, um, I mean, they sort of like some aspects of design, but others, uh, Cave, a body that I'm very fond of and was previously connected with, you know, one of them calls it bureaucratic, unaccountable design crats imposing an architectural monoculture on Britain. You know. um, uh, another very prominent member of the cabinet, um, building schools for the future, what was this? Characterised by massive overspend, tragic delay, botched construction projects, needless bureaucracy. A secretary of state who says that um, this government is all about dismantling barriers that stymie growth, hold back investment and uh, you know, regulation and bureaucracy, the enemies of enterprise. Um, and effectively we have a government that in many ways doesn't actually like government. Uh, and we've already seen that, um, uh, from one of my opponents, that design currently barely features uh, in government statements. We have a minister where it's sort of tucked into his job description, I think we heard somewhere, David Willits. And I think, frankly, until we hear somebody like George Osborne from the Treasury, rather from Biz, rather than Biz, say on five consecutive occasions that he thinks design is the way out of the current economic crisis, Frankly, we should not produce another lovely electronic statement, lovely though they are, and I'm very keen on them, and I'm very happy to do some research about it. <laughs> <laughs> Secondly, um, I would also be absolutely in favour of voting for this if uh, the economic situation encouraged it. Now, some of us may argue, of course, that that's precisely the point. At a time of national peril like this, where 64% of us believe that young people today will face lower living standards than we have at the moment uh, for the foreseeable future, where more of us now believe that our kids are going to be worse off uh, than we were for the first time ever, um, and certainly since we started polling in the, early, in the late 1960s, I would be in favour of it. But you know, at the moment, quite frankly, if, I, if somebody rocks up from anywhere, from China, India, Russia, and offers to carpet large parts of the country in big blocks or sheds, government will probably say yes and celebrate and say, hallelujah, jobs are being created. And the design of those blocks will not be a big issue, quite frankly. Um, uh, so I would, I would believe it if they said no to certain things. But I don't, at the current sense, it's all about growth. It is not about beauty, utility, or any of the things that many of the people in this room may hold dear. Thirdly, I would be in favour of it if this government, or any government in this country, showed any signs of ever being able to implement this type of joined up initiative. The previous government, said good words, many of us have been involved in trying to encourage departments to be coordinated about this, and frankly, we have to argue that um, even with money flowing as never, probably never again, or certainly not in our lifetimes, uh, it turned out to be impossible. Now, government can do a few things in extremists. It can do terrorism if it has to, um, it can sort of just about do the Olympics, but really, the idea of, um, as we've heard, the need for a coherent and aligned strategy across departments um, you know, championed by one or two of them and, and then everywhere else, frankly the chances of this, I would say, are absolutely nil. So my um, feelings about this are that at the moment, even though many of us may be in favour, I would suggest that more in sorrow than anger, we should actually vote against um, having a uh, government win some party, until in our hearts we believe that the government actually really wants to do this. This would include more than one or two cabinet ministers being enthusiastic and you know, actually feeling confident that the government really did want to celebrate for this <coughs> because there is, there is something noble there, there is something great, but at the moment it just ain't going to happen, and um, I think it would make far more impact if you voted against it, and the reporting you might get for that, than if you just did the usual thing. Thank you very much. <laughs> so the debate has taken its twists and turns, but... We now open that up because um, this, as we said right at the beginning, the whole point of these forums is all about making sure that this these conversations happen. Um, we have provocations. We are going to go back to our speakers at the end to get their nano nuggets before we vote. Um, we will be able to, and you may want to, recraft some of the propositions that we take in the conversation. Um, just to remind you how we're going to do this, you're going to, you're, when you speak, please speak very clearly. The boom is going to move around, is that right? To make sure that we pick up the debate so that we can broadcast the debate. And do say who you are as well. Um, if you want to say where you're from, that's also fine. And get your views put, and come on, let's, let's hear the rest of the debate. Okay. <coughs>
Let's get them there. I, I just, uh, shall I stand up? Yes, please. Good, yeah. Thank you. I just wanted to come back to Ben, actually. I thought, really, uh, repent at haste and, oh no, what is it? Hyped <laughs> in haste and repent at leisure. Ben, I thought your comment on the carpeting and the blocks was uh, very short termist, and actually, surely, that's exactly what we don't need the repenting at leisure. We need to be planning, to be thinking in an integrated way, to be looking at the big picture and not to be spending millions of pounds later. So, um, Okay, an argument against defeatism over here. Yep. Um, my name is Mark Adams. I'm managing director of Vitsu. Well, we've had the Danes speak this morning, and I think we were all reasonably convinced. My background, the company's background, which I just want to put into context, is a Danish name, uh, but we've worked with a. I've had the privilege of working with a German designer for. 25 years, but we're a British manufacturing business. We make and export. And what uh, I have been um, hearing today is the absolute need for a bottom-up approach. The German system of government, the federal system of government, um, allows so much to be to brought up the, um, up the agenda. And I'll pause at that point. Thank you, if I may. Okay. Um, I mean, I would just like to say initially, of course, the government does already have a design strategy. Um, I think it's important. I should have said, I'm Brad Bennett, I'm an architect. I'm also a trustee of the Design Council. I mean, the, the strategy, of course, is a key part of that strategy is how designers are chosen. And we all know there's an absolute link between the quality of design and the quality of the designer. So the choice of that designer is fundamentally important. And of course, what happens at the moment, the design strategy that the government has is it's chosen, the designers are chosen on the basis of the cheapest, the largest, and the most experienced, which basically means uh, low quality all round, young firms get nowhere, and of course the buildings are poor. Now that is the current strategy. So what I'd like to suggest is we do have a strategy, but we change it, because the current one is bad for business, it's bad for the future with firms coming through, it's bad for UK PLC, and of course it's bad for the public who have to experience the quality results that are coming from the system. So let's change it, not reinvent, reinvent it from scratch. I'm going to keep us going, gathering some of the various thoughts. I might actually let some of the uh, our genre provocateurs in as well. But let's 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 catch some more of the views uh, around the river. Just up. So I'm Tony Edwards um, from Place Design and Planning, the landscape architect and architect. Um, I think we have to be careful when we talk about designing, whether you're talking about spaces, because we heard from Tim Horton, which is essentially land use planning, or product design, or process design, or as we heard when John, uh, Jonathan Ives came here in June, if you're going to do a successful project, you've got to put it all together. It's not just you sorting out the electronics, it's what it looks like, how you market it, how you brand it, and integrate all those things together, which are important considerations. Um, but it, I think if it's going to be a recipe for purely resourcing or sort of manufacturing, that's also not going to work as well, because in a program immediately after we heard that discussion, it was pointed out Apple get $80 per iPad for all the intellectual rights, and the factory in Taiwan gets $5 to actually assemble it, so it will not be a resurgence of manufacturing industry either. Okay, so that's the key point there around integration as well, around design mm -hmm. rigid. Richard Simmons, University of Greenwich, and formerly Chief Executive of CABE. Um, I'm quite depressed about the terms in which this debate has taken place so far this morning because it's all about the economy. If you look at how the Danes are defining uh, good design, we saw all, all their, their strategy, which we saw on the screen, the first thing it says is about quality of life. And it seems to me that a democratically elected government should be deeply concerned with the issue of quality of life. I'm not a massive believer that strategy is going to work, but if we are going to have a strategy, it needs to focus not just on the economy, but actually on the quality of people's lives and improving it. Can I, make it? Please. Yes. Um, I agree with you entirely, and it was one of the points perhaps I didn't make as strongly as I should have, but that we need to have a vision about what role design has, what, what its purpose is, and where we're going with it beyond just short-term economic quick fixes. And I think until we remove the debate from this temporary government fixation, we should not develop a new strategy. We need to stand back, much as the Danes do, and say, before we write our strategy, we will develop a vision for the future. It might be interesting here to hear back from not just the other side, but also from the Federation of British Industry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I absolutely agree with you, though. Um, I think quality of life is fundamental to what I was talking about. 
But I guess my approach to it is by realising economic growth so that we have enough money and funds to actually <coughs> fund some of the fancier designs and better quality things that we might like for the future. So I wouldn't just, I wouldn't put, I, I think economic growth comes first. If we can, if we can achieve that, then we will realise quality of life. Can I come back for two seconds to say that? Only works if you believe in the fantasy of the trickle down effect, uh, which doesn't actually really work. Okay, we've got some comments coming in over here. Um, we'll just, can we go along this line? In a way, so Gus Debras, the chairman of British Design Innovation. In a way, to build on that, isn't there not at the core of this an understanding that all innovation, the success of it, depends on its interaction with people? eventually. And what we're arguing for here is humanism in the practice of innovation. And so that's what we should be talking about. So it seems to me that there are two things that need to be done to reframe the question, which is one, say, should the government have a useful design strategy? And should we clarify that when we talk about design in this way, we're actually talking about a humanistic approach to design, which is what bridges architecture, industrial design, planning, and all of these other factors where you connect economic activity to innovation and to a better quality of life. Um, well, I thought that we were hearing many of you that integration went beyond, that integration went beyond innovation and that actually the discussion... Well, again, that's, you know, that's change, somebody... making sure that change represents progress yes. is done by putting a humanistic approach at the heart right. of how you do it. Right. Uh, and yes. that's what design is. Yeah. Um, Chris Wise, um, former trustee here and uh, past master of the Royal Designers for Industry, among other things. Um, I was struck by the T-shaped designer and I found myself thinking, what shape are the politicians and the project <laughs> managers? And uh, the best I could come up with was a slug. Or, uh, uh, it would be really good to have horizontal, hor horizont today, horizontally, <laughs> horizontally shaped politicians would be very useful. Um, not in tabloid, the tabloid sense, obviously. And, um, because I think you want people who are broad, because I, I found myself, contrary to the way I voted at the beginning of this, agreeing with the opposers to the motion. Because I think you can't have a strategy without a vision. You can't have a vision unless you're broad. And I think unless politicians change from being eye-shaped politicians, which is what they seem to obsess about most of the time, to being um, slug-shaped, we probably won't get the vision. So I'd be arguing... <laughs> A change of uh, politician policy, political shape from eyes to slugs. So you're saying change the politician? Change them from vertically and specialised in um, narrow areas into broad based so that we get a decent vision first and don't have a strategy before you've got a vision. Right. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. My name is Elspeth Gibson. I work in local government and in Suffolk County Council we've benefited from the Design Council programme, Public Service by Design. And I'm concerned, Laura spoke of you can't be half pregnant, which I think is a great phrase, but also let's not you know, switch off the baby's life support at its first breath because in the local government context, design, one of the biggest challenges we have is how you convey value in something that hasn't yet been realised. I don't think in a lot of local government settings and situations we've realised that design isn't an object-based type activity that goes on as a design school. We haven't incorporated it into the way we look at our services. So I'm a very strong advocate, don't cut it off before it's really not, be you know, not yet begun. Let's find a way of making design process habitual, not routine because it would lose its edge then, but really just keep the energy around it because there is so much to do. So in, in, in essence as well, little. You aren't taking the grand steps, you can keep taking the little steps as well. Absolutely. Um, That's, I, mean, I, would, I can that. I don't, you know, are we asking Eric Pickles to come forward and announce what the you know, government's design policy is for local governments? I rather fear that would probably not be what we want. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just say, this, this worries me slightly, and this completely defeatist, this idea that uh, we, you know, the government doesn't understand us, therefore we will not ask for a design strategy. Come on, you know, we've got the government, we've got, our role is to go out there and influence them to support British design industries. Mm. Yeah, and I think that what Ben was saying was, well, let's wait till everyone's signed up before we have a strategy. And that's, that is completely defeatist. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Did you want to come back on that? I'm just a realist. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we've got a number of hands going up over here. Uh, Frank Peters and uh, the gentleman in front of him at the back. Frank? Thank you very much. Um, focusing on that comment that's on there, I, um, the fact of government having a role in design strategy, 
um, it, it, it does worry me. I think the design sector should have a design strategy to influence government as much as if you look at um, developers, constructors, etc. I've had a brilliant strategy in terms of influencing the national planning policy framework, um, which is, you know, has been labelled a, a developer's charter. So it does worry me make government get involved. And also, they've had a strategy. They set up the Council of Industrial Design in 1948. Why are we having to raise their perception with a crane? I don't understand that bit. And also, it was fairly clear from, I think it's Fergus from this, when he actually said, um, we had to change the name of something for the politics. Well, that's the problem, is we're short term, we're involved in a political game, etc., etc. The design sector, I think, should have its own strategy, and that will influence government. Okay, so that's, in a way, you're, uh, uh, almost a, 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 a position to take, if I was able to come in on that, which is, should the design sector have a, a design strategy to influence government? Um, but um, somebody may want to respond. Is that, was that a sort of response to that? No, no it isn't. It's not a point. So we've got two points over here. Yes, we've got the right time. Uh, yes, good morning, Adam Sharples, until recently in the Department for Work and Pensions. Uh, I just wanted to say I thought the most persuasive uh, case in favour of the motion was, in fact, made by Laura speaking against it. <laughs> um, yes, of course, we need the vision, but just try having visions without yeah, strategies and uh, imagine how far uh, you get. Uh, not very far in my view. What's the alternative to having a strategy? Um, well, a lot of rather random, inconsistent uh, interventions. So, yes, let's have the, the vision, let's have the practical plans, but strategy is essential to join them up. If I could just add one thought, linking with the gentleman behind me. I do think that there is a communication issue, and I think most people in government, when you talk about design, just think about architecture, occasionally public space, it's how things look. Whereas for me the most powerful message here is that design is about how things work. And if we can get that embedded in the government strategy, that will start to make a real difference. Thanks. Uh, Peter Stewart, I'm an architect and once ran the uh, design review program at CAVE a, a few years ago. Um, I'm sort of really speaking about the built environment side of things. and I. You know, my answer to the question is um, put uh, in front of us is there probably should be a design strategy, but perhaps it's not the government who should, who should have it, as has already been suggested. And I wanted to reflect on the, the South Australia example, which I thought was interesting, because um, it strikes me that the chances of localism, the precepts of localism resulting in anything remotely good in respect to design emerging is absolutely zilch. Um, Government may or may not have a role, but I think between those two sorts of scales, there's a really important aspect of place and scale to do with the city or the city region. So that the point that came across about South Australia was there was a group of people in a place who were committed to making that place a large functioning entity, i.e. a city, making it a better place. It was their place. That is not the same thing as being as being an, a UK or English uh, government. So I think there's, an, you know, and one, one could imagine under a different sort of dispensation, one could imagine London being a place like that. So I think it's quite important, I, I, I suppose I'm limiting myself to the built environment, but it could apply to a lot of things too, to think about the possibilities of the design ethos of a place smaller than a country. That might be why the Germans don't have it at a federal level, because they might have this stuff going on at state ask, level. Can I just ask whether there's anybody who wants to pick up on that point about place? Because place, of course, is not just about buildings and built environment, it's also about all the interactions of services and products and so forth. And I wonder whether there's any, any, any you, you said you were speaking part of the built environment. Yeah. I don't know whether anybody else wants to come in on that, but anyway, that's a, it's another thought. There are not, I'm going to, I want to get this part of the room in, but there are a lot of hands went up over here. So I'm going to get, I think we'll go Vicky, we'll go and do a little arc here, and then we'll come over to this side, so get your hands ready. <laughs> Um, Vicky Price, I was just thinking in terms of trying to link um, what we all would like to see on the design front with sort of justification on the economic um, side uh, and therefore having a strategy implemented. I mean, clearly, whatever strategy is put together or a vision that's created as part of the strategy, you can't have a strategy without a vision. So I don't see anything we have any proper argument about this right now. Um, it is really to think of the win-win, how, how design can help economic growth. And there's an interesting uh, sideline to that, which is the unemployment uh, aspect, which uh, Ben mentioned. Um, of course, what we do see is that quite a lot of design companies are basically you know, self-starters up to a point. Uh, there's a lot of entrepreneurship that goes on in this area. Lots of 
people who study it mm -hmm. then go on and do something themselves, mm -hmm. which is the sort of thing which the government is trying to encourage anyway. So let's not think that the two things are incompatible. Actually, design can actually help both the unemployment situation or design education, the unemployment issue, particularly among the young, and also contribute to greater growth. That's good. Yeah, um, Chris Crook, I represent the, the, the house building industry, um, where I've spent most of my professional career. I could vote for a motion that says, should the government have an innovation strategy? But I think um, the design strategy is for us to influence. Can I just make the point that the only residential scheme to win the Sterling Prize is a result of British design skill and local government innovative control. And it's a very, very successful place. And I don't think necessarily localism should prevent creative design. Uh, Peter Neal, uh, landscape architect, once uh, ran the public space uh, enabling programme for, for CABE. I, w I want to know a bit more about what the core priorities for the strategy would be before I think I could vote for it. And I think Tim and Ruth talked about particularly the value of being integrated and across government is key. But I think there were three words that came out of the Danish presentation about solving grand challenges. And I'm really interested to know if we have a strategy, what are the key grand strategies beyond economic growth that key, sorry, key grand challenges beyond econo economic growth should be in that design strategy? key point is, if you're going to, you're going to, I'm going to come back, we will come back to it, but I, I, we've been a little bit one-sided over here, so we're coming back over here. Oh, and, and, and what about the middle? Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, who, was, who was putting up their hand? Maybe you were putting Oh, I'm sorry, yes, hi, Joanna. Hi. Uh, Joanna Averley from Centre for Cities. Um, the question about should it be a government strategy somebody else has raised, uh, and should it be a government design strategy, uh, my view is the government needs an investment strategy and by which it uses design to make the right decisions. It's a slightly different emphasis because in any form of business investment thinking, you have to know where to invest to get the best results and the best outcomes. And design has, it has a role to play, whether that's where you put the housing, where you put the infrastructure, the use of design within uh, supporting different businesses and so on. So does government need a design strategy? Government needs an investment strategy informed by creative design that's place specific and business specific. Um, and it's a slightly different take. I think the question is slightly wrong. Right. So maybe the question is, should government have an investment strategy? Now, lots of hands have gone up over here. Joyce, we'll start with here. I'm Joyce Bridges, a former Code Commissioner, and I'm a member of the Mayor of London's Design <coughs> Advisory Panel. Um, I mean, I, I thought there were excellent presentations, but I was struck by Ben's point that, um, you know, until we can influence George Osborne, we're just not getting anywhere. And I think in the current climate, we should be concentrating on how we can raise the case for design, how we can influence government to recognise the role of leadership. Um, and we shouldn't be too diverted into some grand process-driven strategy. We should really use our resources to be campaigning and working where we can to make a difference. So the National Planning um, Policy Framework talks about design. How can it make, be made stronger? The housing strategy talks about design. So what is going to be done to ensure it happens? It's these kind of questions, I think, that can move things forward in the current climate. <laughs> uh, can we come down here, actually, and start with a brief, and then come over here? Uh, can we come over here? Lucy Kimber, Young Foundation and Said Business School. Um, I was struck by the distinction that Chris Wise alluded to earlier, the distinction between incremental improvement and innovation. And if we, we know that innovation is messy, it's disruptive, it leads to the reconfiguration of people and things doing stuff differently. And it's profoundly unknown. Um, the consequences may be quite short term or quite long term. Governments are not in the business of doing innovation. They are not in the business of disruption. They are in the business of incremental improvement. So seeking um, 
trying to ask a government to have a design strategy that's for innovation um, is it, it's not going to happen. But I think it's also the wrong place to look for change and radical change of the kind that, that we need to address some of the contemporary challenges. So I think the question that's being posed today is, is, is wrong, it's interesting. Um, not so much should government have a design strategy, but how can we as individuals um, and, and members of organisations, how can we do strategy locally, um, regionally, nationally, internationally? And pose that question question back to ourselves. Okay, can I can I just come back to and ask you because I thought that actually what Fergus was saying was <coughs> that it's not government's role to just be innovative but to create the environment. This was about systems, wasn't it? Which which and, and actually government has a role as, as uh, a, a, an investment partner in creating some of that and, and creating that, that environment. Uh, which is where I, presumably uh, yeah, again it's an interesting question and I was really interested in those points that Fergus and also Benamit but it's like do you really does one really think that government has the, 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 the the levers to do some of that stuff really we you know the bond markets you know should they have a strategy for design they probably have more of an influence on design in the UK and globally than um, even the Chancellor Hi, I'm Liz Peace. I'm Chief Executive of the British Property Federation, uh, but I was a civil servant for 27 years, and, and you know, I have a bit of a, a feel for what governments can and can't do. Uh, I don't think governments are capable of having large Soviet-style strategies. Well, the Soviet Union tried, and look where, it, uh, look where it actually got them. I found it deeply worrying that somebody said they thought localism was actually going to be the enemy of achieving uh, good design. I'm talking particularly in the context of the built environment, because actually, at the end of the day, that's where it happens in a, a local place that means something to a lot of local people. So I think that the only strategy central government should have is finding ways of facilitating other people lower down the chain to work out a strategy. Um, Peter Mason, uh, National Measurement Office, but my standpoint as a still practicing civil servant dealing with design issues for, for several years. Um, and I think there are certain optional elements in what we've been talking about. I mean, should government be influencing business, uh, the way business applies design? Yes or no. Should uh, government be promoting design businesses? Yes or no. Uh, should they be de changing the way that design skills are developing? Yes or no. But there's one element which is non-optional, and that is that when government buys things, or indeed, as Adam has pointed out, when it... Uh, de uh, designs things, there is a design element. And the question is, is that a conscious design element or an unconscious design element? And does that produce good design or bad design? Now, it does seem to me that if we talk about that form of government design strategy, it is both non-optional non and uh, something where the design community has a great deal to contribute. Um, Andrea Siodmok, um, Chief Designer at Cornwall Council, uh, currently writing a government, local government design strategy. Um, but I agree with Ben, um, which is that I think it has to come from the heart. And so I was really pleased to see David Cameron at IDEO experiencing it. So if government needs to value design, they should get real and on the ground and see it in the, in the live. And you know, it's been quite fashionable in innovation to talk about backing winners. And now I hear the, the innovation jargon is about backing races. Well, I think in the design sector, we have a global thoroughbred. So government should crack the whip. <laughs> yeah, just, sorry. Um, <clears throat> a couple of things. Firstly, just to remind everybody that George Osborne, of course, did um, end his uh, budget speech in April with talking about made in Britain, designed in Britain, created in Britain. I'm not sure that was quite the order, but actually he was making a commitment there. Where that's gone, I really don't know. But um, I think the point that I wanted to make was to pick up on something that Laura mentioned, which was around education, because it seems to me that the reason we have fantastic creative industries in this country was because there was investment in our colleges, in practical and academic education. Um, and an education system that produced fantastic people. And I think there's a real issue that we have in the way in which uh, design technology and craft, for that matter, as I represent the Crafts Council, um, is taught or, or not going to be taught in the future in schools. And also how that then um, cuts off the supply of new designers, new makers, architects, engineers, but also uh, reduces demand because you then have a generation of people who don't know anything about design. 
And for me, that's a hugely important part of this argument, and it's not being made, and I think we really do need to focus on it. Just, I, I'd like to bring um, some lessons from business into this. And as a practicing designer, I spend a lot of time convincing boards and industry to spend large amounts of money on leading their innovation projects with a humanistic approach. And people talk about people not getting it and things like that. And it seems to me that one of the reasons we do need a strategy is to move from a posture as an industry where we're really dependent on other people getting tacit things. And we need to actually connect with where business is. And where business is, is in a situation where fields of economics, like behavioral economics, have more credibility now than they ever had. There's a realization that a lot of the economic modeling at the root of business is grossly oversimplistic. And the business itself is understanding that actually the value in industry and the notion of excellence in organizations is in the experience of the interaction between you and not just users, but customers and all the other stakeholders. And so in business, it's quite straightforward to talk about experience-led innovation as actually an imperative in, in, in business. And that goes into architecture and all the, other, all the other areas. And that language, that's the language that we need to adopt. And that's the language that will be understood in number 10 as well. You know, they're quite, there's nothing wrong with being a skeptic. It might, be, it might be good to have a strategy, but this, as we've just heard, design gets everywhere. And how we embed a strategy in government. I think the Design Council, if you look at the history of the Design Council, the Design Council has been in the position of delivering government policy, even though it may not have been uh, official government policy, because it was funded by the government and it responded. So if you look at the history, in the 1940s, the Design Council was promoting the textiles in the industry, even though it was going to decline. We are now in a position where the Design Council and CABE have sort of been liberated and we should actually be using the Design Council and, C and CABE to d deliver proactive, evidence-based support for where design can help the economy and well-being and society and drive that through the different departments. So I think we do need a strategy but I think it needs evidence-based outside organisations to put, drive it. Uh, Debbie, uh, uh, David, I've got a, a proposition to make, which is I think that um, if government truly believed in design, um, it would ask the design industry in its broadest form to come up with the vision that we so desperately need. It's what we do, it's what we get paid for, against which I think a co-owned strategy could be developed, uh, funded, which is their bit of it, and implemented. Yeah. Seems to be an important point of what is coming through. Um, let's take some more questions here. If we could do a little cycle round right here. Yeah. Uh, Mike Hayes, I think I may be beginning to move from a yes to a no. Oh, and I'm doing that <laughs> because I'm struggling with two words. The first word is design, and the second word is strategy. Um, I, think, I think the language here is becoming extraordinarily important. I think design is a very, very difficult word for people to get their head around. But we should be talking about Fitness, fitness for purpose, renewable quality of life, safety, security, economic efficiency, value for money. To deliver any of those, you need to design the outcome. So don't talk about the design process, let's talk about the outcome. And rather than strategy, maybe we just need debate and conversation to raise the question, how do we do these Isn't things? Isn't there something about, because we heard earlier about defining one's terms though about design? Uh, beauty should be well, absolutely. <laughs> I, agree, I, I agree absolutely with that. Well, yeah. well maybe, yeah. but we have to find language that people embrace and understand and want to achieve. Yeah. The, Vicky just wants but, to uh, Since you're over here, um, um, and, uh, given that I have been involved in a number of strategies which have been implemented, or well, up to a point in the past, there is no way that anyone can produce a strategy without A, having the vision, and B, involving the community uh, that uh, is interested in this. So, so when we're talking about putting something together, we're talking about different things. Um, no strategy worth its salt can actually be developed without active participation of the sector. Right. Now, what I'm going to do is we're going to take a few quick, three, four <coughs> quick inputs here. I want to make sure that we, we, we have a formulation of questions as well 
Um, so so I, I'm going to propose some, but others may come forward with them. But let's get these Thank quick you. comments. But you can try and keep them quick. Yeah, I'm very, um, struck, by the, ten, very ten struck by the comments for the need of evidence-based. And I do feel that we wouldn't be having this discussion if we actually had the measures Earlier in the morning, there was a bit of talk about sort of old-fashioned or legacy disciplines around, sorry to say this, Vicky, economics, accounting, the value paradox, you know, managing intangibles and how we do all of that today. I feel that the strategy, the design strategy need question wouldn't be a question if we could prove it, and maybe the focus needs to be on the evidentiary base for the future. Evidence research, and, and, and we might want to pick up. I, mean, I know that there was a comment made by um, Fergus in his talk about the research base. Um, I, I think there's much more that we'll need to talk about that, and we've actually been uh, already proposing that we do the next forum on the whole research and evidence base. Um, um, did um, uh, did. did Dids MacDonald, um, anti-copying and design. <coughs> it's taken 15 years to get intellectual property and design in the, used in the same sentence, which has been translated into uh, government recommendation number seven from the Hargreaves Review. Um, as intellectual capital underpins the whole of the design sector, whilst I agree with all the ifs that Laura uh, made, and also uh, Tim in ter terms of, ideally we'd like to have a government will rather than being chain ganged. Uh, in the land of reality, uh, the fact remains that even in a recession, there's a quarter of a trillion spend using design, um, which could do more with less. Mm. Um, and also, the reality is that we need economic <coughs> growth to survive. So, can we afford to wait another 60 years? Okay. Pam? Um, I think that one of the things in common with all the four speakers who started was that they were saying design strategies were necessary but not sufficient. And I want to emphasise the point someone else made, that we have a government that's beginning to say design matters. <coughs> Let's not throw that baby out before it's even had the chance to grow. Um, I don't think we can hold their feet to the fire if we don't have some strategies that can be measured and where we can go and say, well, did you do it there? And if it matters, why aren't you doing it here? Um, so I was very tempted by the no arguments, but I'm still in the yes camp. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Jake Leith, uh, President of the Charter Society of Designers. I believe that we do need a design strategy, but it should not be the government who is setting this. It is, we are a world leading, as far as design goes, the designers that we have. We have the history, we have the pedigree, uh, and what we need is support if we're going to be serious about exports, uh, attracting investment, growth. All those things need to be done in a more collaborative way. <coughs> Thanks. D uh, the DCMS uh, of happy memory used to say that they didn't have an architecture policy for the UK because they had CABE. And I think I want to reinforce the point about activism, which we haven't really talked much about. The Design Council, uh, now combined with CABE, is the focus for activism in this area. It's important, and for me, more important even than the strategy that the government provides it with the industry with a sustainable model for its future, which it doesn't yet have. And so, for me, that's where I would start. I'll get back on the horse if I may, David. Um, what I think has been fascinating is we go right back to the first point that was made at the beginning of today was that Germans do not have a design policy. And I think what we're hearing today is because it is utterly endemic in German society, Danish society we did hear today, that it comes from the bottom up. And it comes through the education system, it comes through the Mittelstand, which we have killed our equivalent of the Mittelstand over the last 30, 40 years, not being mentioned today at all. And therefore, we have to take it back to our education system so that it is endemic. Therefore, the, the politicians are receptive to it. They don't have to have it imposed from the top as a policy. They have it within their body and soul. And that's what you see in Germany and Denmark, and I think that is just, what we have gone such a long way to losing but, in this country. Just, just to clarify, Mark, I think the point, and, and, and I don't know whether, is Gavin still here? Yeah. Gavin, I, I think the point was that your study didn't include Germany, not that Germany didn't have a design policy, is that right? The, the map it wasn't just our study, it was, it was looking at the whole of Europe. But, right. um, but um, I mean, I'm building what you were saying as well, Germany's had this kind of different approach, and when I was looking at innovation quite a while ago, they got. They look at in, in investments, in, say, in infrastructure and in, in industry for plant, etc., on a much longer investment period. Whereas over here, it's kind of three years. You need to pay back. But 
Germany so to maybe it's 10 the years. the core of the system, I yeah. think, is, is the point. Okay, I think... And the the USA as well, which is... I'm going to take two yeah. more points, we're then going to have to go into our voting, otherwise we'll run out of time. Um, am I okay for time? Yeah. 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 So, um, come on. Extremely, extremely quick point. It's just to say that, of course, government expenditure represents 40% of the construction industry's expenditure. So we must have a, a policy for that. I think my point builds on that entirely. If there is a government design strategy, it should focus on procurement and the power of government to make a difference. And I think in that sense, in, as a person in local government, if I could lay my hand on a thousand service designers right now, that would be a good thing for the UK economy, because we have big problems. And I think that those kinds of approaches, which we haven't talked about today, have, really have a foothold in the future. Okay. Look, I'm going to go on. Just just keep keep the government says so much. Oops. The government is so active in the economy that we do need a policy to make sure that what business knows about design excellence is applied. But I think that that strategy should be led. I agree with the points made by the CSD, DBA, and on behalf of BDI, make the same point that the practitioners in industry who earn a living making these arguments day in day out should be leading that strategy. Okay, I'm going to, as I said, nano comments from over here. Um, so um, they're going to be very, very brief. If you want to just say something, we'll go back, back in the order that we started. Tim, any, any, any quickies? I, I think you're all actually in line of agreement. So long as the strategy uh, has a vision embedded and that it is taken forward across government. Uh, and it's lovely to see some other government departments here, not just this. But I've noticed from the attendance list that we don't have the likes of the Highways Agency, Environment Agency, DEF, DEF for MOD, MOJ, HMRC, HMT, the NHS, etc. in this room. And wouldn't it be lovely if they were engaged? And I think if we had a design strategy across government, they would be engaged. I absolutely agree with the timing of procurement. I think that's fundamentally the way forward. And I'd just like to sort of, sort of finish with one um, paraphrase from Prince Philip, who was here on Tuesday with the Pittsburgh Designers Prize. My paraphrase of exactly what he said was that design allows you to see better solutions, not just the obvious ones. And I think if we had a strategy, we'd see more of these better solutions being delivered by business and by government. Are the better um, there is no debate about the value of design, absolutely none. We could sit here all day and talk about it, and I'm in complete agreement with it, as you know, with what's been said. But please do not let us, let any government, get away with believing that they have really done something by simply stating a strategy. As everyone here has said, we need to look beyond that. We need to look at the vision. We need to look at the integration. We need to create the plans. We can't just tick a box. Gavin showed one slide with colors, I think, of every country that had a, quote, design policy. And then he said, oh, well, at least they mentioned design somewhere. <laughs> we can't do that. We have to create something of real meaning so that this true value of design can be capitalized on. Um, yep. Uh, Where are we now? Yes, my apologies. I'll be a bit near if we're going to keep the horse metaphors going. Um, I've heard lots of elements about what this strategy is going to contain. It's about growth, quality of life, procurement, integration, it's about how things work, it's about reducing unemployment. Um, none of these are an argument against having a strategy. And in fact, making design endemic will not happen spontaneously. And it will happen with leadership from the top. And because I'm very keen on messaging, be very careful if this room votes against the government having a design strategy. <coughs> it will undermine our message forever uh, to government, but it will also undermine our industry. So vote for the motion. Ben, I think I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> Uh, now, I'm I'm, I want to test some, um, my wise people in the corner have been scribbling away, um, and they've got some formulations of some questions that we might want to consider. Um, 
and I jotted one down as well. Um, um, one is, does the UK <coughs> need an integrated design vision first? This could be one question that we uh, vote on. Another is that should the design sector develop its own strategy is another. And should a design strategy focus on quality of life is another. Um, and I've also got my own formulation, which is this House believes that government should fund a co-created, joined up design vision and follow it through with a strategy and action plan. Does it? That sounds like maybe I've found myself in the middle. Uh, <laughs> um, but um, so, does anybody violently disagree or want to give me a, an instant formulation of another question that is, is, is a better formulation? I think there's four elements that can be part of the strategy. Yes. But they're fantastic. But they're good questions. They're good questions, but they can be part. So we're all happy we asked those questions. Well, not instead. Not instead of the motion. You're going to finish with the motion. We'll just get a few little testers going. Um, I would add, um, should a government strategy for design apply only to government? To what government should do, not to what the industry is. Well, I think that's... Or should the government be that, yes. held to implement its own strategy? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Does Bruce agree on to be... Yes, I think is this government, isn't it? So, what we're going to do is, you've already just quickly formulated, have you got those three down? We can, now, we can now put them up, and if people disagree with the question, we can change it and then we'll vote. Okay, so put those questions <laughs> Okay, so, we're not going to vote on whether we need... So, does the UK need integrated design vision first? is you're going to vote on.
should a design strategy be focused on local and national government's use? Is that right? What is that? Sorry, should a design strategy yeah, be focused? Should, a, should yeah. the strategy be focused? Because the government strategy should focus on how they spend money. Yes, on their on their spend. So basically, this is the commissioning point. Should a design strategy be focused on how government uses design? But does it mean primarily as part of the overall strategy or? Um, what is focus mean? Right, this, is, this is actually saying that if we had a design strategy, it would be primarily on government and how it spends its money. Primarily. Primarily. So, primarily. So, should a design strategy be primarily focused? Can we, so we don't change it, but if everybody understands that, it should be primarily focused on how government uses design. So, so have we forgotten skills completely in this? It hasn't. So, yeah, we can, can, so no, we cannot vote on that. I mean, the government has got let's, 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 let's get this one in. <laughs> We've got a high proportion. Oh, right, okay. Well, can we, can we actually try reformulating that on the education? <laughs> no, it's, a it's a different question. It's a different question. Focused on education. <laughs> Question, but can we, can we reformulate the question? No, we need to reformulate that one. Can you just reformulate it? So we're just reformulating that. We'll pick, we'll pick so I think the question is should a government strategy be primarily focused on education? <coughs> or, or have a strong focus on education? <coughs> or have education as a Yep. <laughs> well, two more questions after this. One, which is the penultimate one, which is the final house question. Losing everybody. Yep. So should a design strategy be focused on education? Um, it doesn't mean it's primarily, but it's obviously got to be an important part of it. Thank <laughs> you. 
But anyway, there's a lot to interpret in there, a lot for us to think about. Um, <laughs> do we get to see the comparison of the figures from the beginning? 17. It was 73. Um, it dropped to 54. <laughs> I think we just need to remember <coughs> that I think there's quite a lot of consensus in this room that we do need a clarity of vision, that we do need a clarity of strategy, and I think some of it is about whether it should be government or the UK or whoever, but that there is a need for us to be clearer about where we're going with design in this country and the power of design. And I think as far as government is concerned, also let's not forget some of the things that came out today. There are no design debates across government, that's absolutely clear. There is no government designer or head of profession. Um, and there is no champion, I have to say, with sufficient clout. And we love having David Willits and one or two other people in the room. But actually, Ben Dryden, until George Osborne starts getting up and talking <coughs> about the power of design and the potential of design to improve quality of life and growth, then I think we have a problem. So I think we've articulated, again, many of you will say, the problem. I think you've given us actually a number of pointers as to how the Design Council and the wider community might take this forward in a way that I don't think we've had before. So I know that many of you will go away remembering phrases like cognitive polysphasia. You can't, you can't be half pregnant and slug-shaped politicians. But I'd like, you to go, I'd like you to go away with maybe a bit more substantial and positive uh, um, reflection upon this debate, which I agree with David, has been absolutely brilliant. Thank you for coming. We really will take this forward. I, I think, uh, I suppose I'm convener, as it were. I want us to see us kind of reflect on this with a number of the people in this room and come back to all of you, you know, with some conclusions on what we're going to do about the things that we've, uh, that we've talked about today. Because someone said there is a design strategy. The government does have a design strategy. It works on a strategy which is entirely inappropriate and unhelpful. If we're going to shift that, then we'd have to put something in its place which is which is more positive and more powerful. So thanks for coming. There's some lunch, I think. Really love you. Yes. And what am I supposed to do that I have no, to do? No, I just want to say is that we will be convening our next forum in March. Um, and we will be looking at, when, at what a UK-wide design research agenda could look like. Um, it is actually based on the fact that um, we have a new partnership with AHRC and we believe that announcements will follow about university funded design research program in the UK. And we always Join have up. we always have fashion to be at the last word. So um, <laughs> I want to say we want these events to be relevant and interesting to you and others and if you've got ideas about issues, subjects which you think we should give half a day to and which we could usefully give half a day to, let us know. But thanks very much, have some lunch. Uh, <laughs>